Michelle Gabriel Caldwell, and I am the Applied Technology Specialist for Wedding and Dispersing Additives. Welcome to Vic's series of training modules. We will begin with the fundamentals. Why should you use a wedding and dispersing additive? Simply put, it's to improve the coating properties when pigments are part of the formulation. Most obvious would be coloristic properties like color stability, transparency, or hide. But viscosity, gloss, and flow and leveling can also be negatively affected. These coating properties would not be optimized if the pigments weren't properly stabilized. Pigments have a variety of sizes and surface areas. The cohesive forces plus the desire to remain in a low energy state causes them to agglomerate. A general rule of thumb, the smaller the pigment particle, the greater the interfacial tension to remain in an agglomerated state. While wetting and dispersing additives are a must for small particles like carbon black and organics, we certainly see benefits for use in larger size pigments as well. For instance, the color development, the strength and stability, and even the transparency is best achieved when working with primary particles, agglomerates, or the act of reflocculation would define the major causes of poor pigment stabilization. Most pigments are purchased in dry powder form in their low energy state. Even those pigments that are predispersed may need some assistance to achieve optimal color development. When dry pigments are received, the first step is to homogenize them into a liquid coating. This initial process is wetting the pigment into the system matrix. And wetting takes place by displacing the air around the pigment, allowing for an easier dispersion process. Let's take a look at good wetting. It's classified as reducing the surface tension between the pigment and the system matrix. The greater the difference, the harder it is to wet the pigment. So clearly the reason why it's easier to wet titanium dioxide than fallow blue in water. Now, we are ready to disperse the pigments once they're properly wetted. This grinding process is all going to be characterized by the equipment, the blades or the mills, the operator, and even the secret sauce from the manufacturing company. It is here where the magic happens. The operator can visually see the viscosity reducing and has the ability to add more pigment into the system without it stopping the machinery. Sometimes the energy or time can also be reduced by saving money annually in operation costs alone. It's typically easy to see these instant results, but we must realize that once the grinding ends, the pigments want to return to their original low energy state, flocculated pigments. The critical moment of additive selection comes into play. How well is it keeping the pigment particles from flocculating? This is a function of time and can only be seen once the dispersion ends. As I mentioned, the flow and ease of dispersion is a function of good wetting properties. Removing air from the pigment surfaces is the best process to see viscosity reduction. This is proved by viscosity reducing of the overall system. As the grind works closer to smaller primary particle sizes. 
the time and energy it takes to disperse pigments needs to be consistently rewarded with properly stabilized pigments. And this should always be the end game. So let's talk about the structure. Most wetting and dispersing additives contain two basic parts, pigment affinity for absorption to the pigment particle, and a compatibilizing unit or a flexible portion that is compatible to the resin solvent matrix. And here you see typical chemistries that are listed for each part. There are three major stabilization mechanisms. The first is electrostatic repulsion, mostly used in aqueous coatings, but can be impaired by the presence of ions. And the second, stereochendrins, is for use in most all system types. Generally, the strongest mechanism, since ions aren't a concern, but compatibility is still a must. And third, electrosteric stabilization, which is a combination of the earlier two with less of a tendency for ion contamination when compared to electrostatic repulsion. So I'd like to pause here to show a video of the differences between flocculation and deflocculation, noting that both paints look the same in the can. They are poured down onto a mylar film and let to dry. Over time, you can see the change in color and the obvious flocculation versus deflocculation. The problem, all pigments and fillers have a tendency to form agglomerates. No matter the ease of wetting, and even the presence of viscosity reduction sometimes, which is most confusing when we're having this conversation about stabilization quality. This all boils down to the additive selection criteria. And at BIC, we do our best to help with that. We separate our labs into end uses to concentrate on different markets. We test several substrates and we focus on system polarity to increase compatibility into your system. All of this research helps us to find the best ways to determine dispersion quality. We know what is commonly used in all of the markets and we challenge those routine testing strategies particularly when it comes to things like the Hegman grind gauge, when carbon black and organics are smaller particle sizes than the gauge would ever pick up as oversized pieces. We focus on consistency and dependability as the result. And that's key for us. And we find that color drift and rub ups provide the best data. When monitoring color shift of the finished product, we determine flocculation as the color shifts clockwise. And conversely, we see deflocculation as the co color shifts counterclockwise. Rub-ups provide the knowledge of vertical striation of the color of pigments, AKA flooding. Performing drawdowns and rubbing the non-cured paint creates more shear. And if more shear is needed to create the color, then the pigments have re-agglomerated and weren't stabilized initially. Other key factors to consider, how much additive to use? I discussed reviewing a ladder study in the polyurethane module. So really kind of take a look at that to get a deeper dive there. Determining order of addition or the type of grind process is imperative because that's also going to determine which type of additive you should use. 
There are some additives that work very well in resin-containing systems and others that do not. Because at the end of the day, pigment affinity and system compatibility are the key elements to choosing the correct wetting and dispersing additive for optimal results. Thank you. And I hope to see you back here soon. Test your knowledge with our fundamentals quiz. Good luck and bye for now. <laughs>